Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace that brought me safe this far, and grace will lead me home. Welcome back to Church History. I'm your host, Laura Lee Siemens. I hope you had a relaxing weekend. I'm excited about this episode, one of my favorite stories in church history. For those of you who have wondered how the book is going, well, it's in the editing phase. And I'm going to be doing an audiobook as well, if you're interested in that. In the meantime, today we're telling the story of the most popular hymn. I was actually planning on doing an episode on the French Revolution. I was doing my research and getting it all ready, but I felt God was saying that the next story should be the life of John Newton. I want you to understand that with this podcast, my goal is to tell the story of the church. I don't do the things that podcasters are supposed to do. I hear from people that they've left really good reviews, and when I was going to go look at them, I felt God tell me not to because this is his podcast and I am just his messenger. This week, I saw that we had over 3,000 downloads in one month. I didn't know if that was even a good thing, but I was talking to a podcasting company that told me it was actually a really high amount. They wanted to know what I was doing to get that amount of downloads. Nothing. I'm doing nothing. I'm just telling the story God wants me to tell. So if you're listening today, perhaps God told me to switch my story this week for you. Perhaps this is a story he wanted you to hear. July 24th, in Waping, London, in the year 1725, Elizabeth Newton gave birth to her son. She named John after his father. John was their only son, and his mother loved him. She spent evenings reading the Bible to little John and prayed that he would grow up to love God and to serve him. She would pray over his bed and pray that God would call him to be a minister. Pray that God would use him to tell the world about God's grace. John was really close to his mother. John Sr., however, did not have a love for God. He was a heavy drinker, and he did not treat his family well. Although as we see the story of John's life, I believe his father really did love him. But he didn't know how to show it to him. He was very harsh with his son. John was just seven years old when his mother contracted tuberculosis. Elizabeth did not survive the illness, and John was left heartbroken. John Sr. did not have the same goals as Elizabeth for their son. He didn't read the Bible to John, and there was no more prayers over his bed at night. But those first seven years installed a faith that was planted deep in the heart of little John. Although it would seem that John turned his back on everything his mother wanted for him, God never stopped calling John. John Sr. remarried and his new wife did not love God, or little John. The boy was sent to boarding school for two years. At the school, John was angry. The loss of his mother, the cruelty from his father, and being sent away all created a storm of anger inside of him. He fought with the other boys. He lied, he stole, he swore. He was kicked out of one boarding school and sent to another school. His behavior only escalated, and after two years, he was sent back home. Those two years of boarding school would be the only education John would receive. No one knew what to do with this little boy. His stepmother didn't want him around. His father was gone for long amounts of time working on ships, and no boarding school would take him. Four years after his mother's death, John Jr. got a job on his father's ship. John Sr. was an officer on the Royal African Company. At only 11 years of age, John quickly took to the life of a sailor. He swore like a sailor, and he made it his goal to be the most vile person on the ship. When John was 17, his father found a way to get him a job in Jamaica, overseeing a slave plantation. All John had to do was show up on time, and he would have a dedicated job overseeing slaves. However, John was visiting some friends in Kent when he met a young lady named Mary. Mary was only 13 years old. 
John, at age 17, fell in love with her at first sight. John was so taken with Mary that he completely forgot about his trip with his father. Mary's family was very wealthy, and John and Mary were having fun on the large estate where she lived. By the time John decided to leave to meet his father, it was too late. His ship had sailed. So the plans John's father had for him were ruined. His father was extremely angry with his son. John found another job on a different ship and headed out to sea. One of the things he loved to do was make up funny songs. He was a great singer and he would sing songs mocking the captain. The other crew members loved to sing along. He also would sing songs mocking God and mocking anyone who would believe in God. While the sailors also loved to sing and laugh along with him, sometimes his songs got so blasphemous that even the other sailors would tell him to stop. One day, a storm came that was so fierce, the other sailors believed it was an act of God. They contemplated throwing John over deck because they believed the storm was God's revenge on the songs John was singing mocking God. Two years later, at age 19, his father forced his son to enlist in the British Royal Navy and serve as a crewman on the ship Harwick. It was clear this boy was trouble. He needed something to get him in shape. His father was afraid his son was going to be nothing but a low-level, drunk sailor. John was still a very angry young man. He hated his life on the ship. He felt like a captive. He wanted to be free, and he wanted to go back to Mary. John decided to plan an escape. He did escape. He deserted. However, he was captured, brought back to the Royal Navy, put in chains, and flogged. After the public flogging, he was sent to his quarters, where he had to stay in isolation for one week, with nothing but water and bread. If you took a snapshot of John's life at this moment, chained up in a ship, with cuts and bruises covering his back from a flogging, you would believe Elizabeth's prayers over her son's crib had not been answered. But one snapshot of life does not tell a story. And God had not forgotten John, even though John had forgotten God. Once the punishment was over, John accepted his life on the ship and lived the life of a sailor, with all the drinking and women that are part of the stereotype of a drunken sailor. In a journal, he wrote that he made it his study to find ways to tempt and seduce others. One day, he was taken to the deck where the captain made a sudden announcement. He was trading John. The captain had met another captain who needed a crew, and he was getting rid of his worst sailor. John was just given to the other ship, and his new captain was a man named Mr. Clo. Mr. Clo was a slave trader, and he owned a plantation. He took John, but not as a sailor for his ship, rather as a slave. Surely there was no one who would miss this man. He was garbage. Mr. Clough took him to his plantation. It was an island near Africa, and John was now a slave. Mr. Clough was an evil man. He treated John extremely harshly. He was held as a captive on the island and forced to work in the hot sun with little food and no shelter. Mr. Clough's wife was an African princess who hated John. She treated him even worse and found enjoyment in seeing him suffer. The other slaves on the plantation were black men. They took pity on John and would sneak him food. If it wasn't for the other slaves feeding him, John would have starved to death. If you saw this snapshot of John's life, you would find John working in the lemon trees on a plantation. John's clothes are ripped and dirty. He's burned from the hot sun. He has no place to sleep. And slaves are feeding him out of pity. If you saw this snapshot you would believe God had forgotten about him. But God had not forgotten about him, and his mother's prayers would be answered one day. John's father was not happy when his ship returned to the dock without him. He learned John had been given to another ship, and there was no official record of where he was. His son was lost somewhere in Africa. He sent out word to all the captains he was friends with who traveled the African coast to keep an eye out for his son, and bring him home if they found him. When John was 22 years old, a storm came, and a slave trading ship was forced to dock on the island to avoid the storm. Mr. Clough welcomed the captain onto his island. 
and after the storm as the captain was walking on the island, he saw John and recognized him as his friend's missing son. He took him, put him on his ship, and John finally escaped the plantation. John then took a job on the slave ship. It was called the Greyhound. He was not the same young man anymore. The time on the island had broken him. And during that year of slavery, he had thought often about his mother and the things she had taught him at an early age. On the ship, he found a Bible and he began to read it. He still didn't believe God was real, but something was calling him. One day he found a book by Thomas A. Kempis called The Imitation of Christ. He didn't know who had brought such a book on board this ship, but he began to read it. These two books made John think about life in a different way. On March 21st, 1748, John woke up in the middle of the night. A huge storm had come upon them. John was rushing to the top deck to help. One of the sailors grabbed his arm and gave him an order. John said he was heading to the top deck. Another sailor pushed past John and climbed the ladder to the top deck. As the sailor entered the deck, a large wave suddenly hit the deck and the sailor was immediately thrown over deck and disappeared into the dark waters. John knew that if he had not been stopped, he would have died. He suddenly knew this was the night he was going to die. This was the night he would know if the Bible was true, if what he had read by Thomas Akempis was true. Through the dark night, John pumped and bailed water out of the ship, trying to survive. In the cold, he suddenly remembered verses his mother had taught him as a little boy. Bible verses he had not thought of in over 15 years. Deep down inside, he wanted to yell, God have mercy. But all that came out was a whisper, God have mercy. It was the first time John had prayed since the death of his mother. The captain came and called John and he was sent to steer the ship. While he stood with his hand on the wheel, suddenly he realized somebody was standing behind him. He turned to see who was there, but he was alone. He suddenly knew that it was God. God was standing there with him. He felt his presence suddenly all around him, and he knew God was real. That storm lasted two weeks, and by the end of the two weeks, many of the sailors had been killed. John had survived. John spent two years on that ship, and he began trying to please God. He knew now God was real. He wanted to be the person God wanted him to be. But he struggled. He was still drinking. He still had anger issues. He would still swear. It seemed that now he knew who he wanted to be, but being that person seemed impossible. Perhaps it was too late for a man like him to change. February the 12th, 1750, John finally returned to England, and he was able to see Mary again. She had waited for him, and the two were married. John was now a husband who believed in God and wanted to please him. But is believing in God and wanting to please him what makes you a Christian? John needed to support his family, so he took a job on a ship. Because he was now trying to do what was right, people saw changes in him, and he was more respected. He was given the job of captain. It was a good promotion and a way to support his family. John had worked on slave ships before and had not really thought anything about it. But God was working in his life, and suddenly his eyes were opened to what was happening. Perhaps now, because he was the captain and it was his personal orders that resulted in the horrific treatment. His ship had been built to hold its human cargo. As a ship arrived in Africa, the slaves were brought to the ship. The slaves had been stripped of their clothes and were wearing only underwear. Their heads were shaved, their feet were tied so they could only walk in small steps, their hands were tied. Once on the ship, they were chained to keep them in small areas where they had room only to lie down or sit. Slaves died of malnourishment. Some committed suicide by escaping their chains and then throwing themselves overboard, taking death as a better substitute than life as a slave. Many others died from sickness, and to stop the spread of sickness among the slaves, sick slaves were often killed by throwing them overboard. Sailors sometimes forced the slaves to entertain them, making them dance or sing for them. Women slaves were abused by the sailors, and some were pregnant by the time they arrived at their destination. 
Slaves who didn't obey were flogged. Some slaves refused to eat, trying to die of starvation as a way of suicide. Their mouths were pried open and food was forced down their throats. John had worked on these ships before, but now he suddenly saw everything as different. He saw these people not as cargo, but as men and women. But he continued to work as a captain on his ship for five years. For five years, God was calling him, telling him to stop, but he refused. He knew now what he was doing was wrong. Every year that passed, every new shipment of slaves, John began to hate again. His anger from his youth came back, but now his anger was towards himself. He hated himself. He hated what he was part of. He couldn't even stand to see the slaves and refused to go to where they were. He couldn't handle even seeing the conditions they were in. He hated everything about it. If you saw a snapshot of John's life now, a captain of a slave ship, refusing to give up the thing God was telling him to give up, you would believe God had not heard the prayers of his mother, who had prayed that God would use her son to preach God's grace. In 1755, John finally walked off his ship for the last time. He gave up. He could no longer be part of that life. He could no longer support the slave trade. He came home to marry a broken man. He was given a job as a tide surveyor and worked for the government. It was a really good paying job. For anyone looking at John, it would seem that his life was good. He was married to the woman he loved. He had a great job. He wanted to please God. He was an upstanding man in the community. But he was haunted. He had nightmares at night. He saw the eyes of the men and women he had shipped off like cattle. He couldn't help but wonder what had happened to them. In total, he had shipped over 20,000 men and women. At night, he would dream his hands were full of blood, and the more he washed them, they could not be washed clean. One day, John met a preacher named John Wesley. He told John about his pain. He told him he wanted to please God, but how could God ever love a man like him? His sin was so evil that not even God could forgive him. John Wesley shared his own testimony, how he spent years trying to please God, but it wasn't until he realized there was nothing you could do to win God's grace that he truly understood God's grace. We talked about John and that story in the episode called The Wesley Brothers. Under the teachings of John Wesley, John Newton came to understand what grace meant. God was not asking John to try and please him in order to have salvation. Salvation was a free gift. John cried out to God. He repented of his sin and he asked for salvation. He then did not try to please God in his own, but with the power of the Holy Spirit. He began to study Greek and Hebrew and read the Bible often. During this time, his wife's siblings died, ten years apart. Mary and John adopted their daughters. Both were named Elizabeth. They called one Betsy and the other Eliza. These two adopted girls would be the only children the couple would have. Eliza passed away as a child, and Betsy became their only daughter. She was very close to both Mary and John. In 1764... When John Newton was 39 years old, the prayers of John's mother was finally answered. He became an Anglican minister of a small church in a tiny village. John was an amazing speaker. Soon people were traveling from nearby villages to hear him speak. One of the things John made a priority in his church was singing. Church services always had lots of singing. John, who had written many blasphemous songs, now wrote hymns. His friends, the Wesley brothers, were also writing many songs. John sang their songs in his services, and they sang his songs in their services. The song John wrote that was a memoir of his life was Amazing Grace, and this song was popular in both the Wesley services and John's services. One day, John caught a little boy stealing some apples. He brought him into the church to do some work for him. John began to teach the boy about God. The little boy was sickly and was living with family because of death in his own family. John saw himself as a little boy. He told him stories of his life, 
and he talked to him about the horror of slavery. The little boy's name was William. He showed a true love for Jesus, and his life was changing. Even as a little boy, John knew God had something big planned for little William. When William's family learned he was studying the Bible, they were not happy, and he was sent back to live with other family. John assumed he would never hear from him again. In 1779, John Newton became the pastor of St. Mary in Woolnoth. This was a large church in London. People now came from all over England to hear John preach and to sing his songs. One day, in his old age, a man in his 20s came to his home. It was William, all grown up now and a member of Parliament. His family had groomed him for the life they wanted, and he was the person they wanted him to be. But he never forgot what John had taught him. He told John that he thought maybe he should leave politics and become a preacher. John told William he was still haunted by the 20,000 lives he had destroyed by being part of the slave trade. If William wanted to serve God, he could do it where he was. He said, Perhaps God has placed you where you are for such a time as this. The slave trade is the most evil thing in our world, and it must be stopped. John helped William by giving him detailed descriptions of what he saw on his ships, the ones he had captained and the ones he had worked on. These descriptions were what William used to get more politicians on his side in the fight to end slavery. William then made it his life goal to end slavery, and he would die hours after the slave trade was abolished and slaves in England were free. We're going to do a whole episode on the life of William in the future. John Newton would not see the end of slavery. He would spend the rest of his life speaking out about the horrors of the slave trade. He wrote books about what he saw and he gave detailed description of the treatments. The elite in proper English society could no longer look away. He would say, I will tell you the horrors. You can do nothing, but you can no longer say you didn't know. In 1790, Mary got cancer and died. Betsy then moved in with John to help her father and take care of him. At this point, he was almost blind, and Betsy cared for him. On December 21, 1807, Newton died peacefully at age 82. Mary and John are buried next to each other at the St. Mary Woolnoth Church in London. Here's a quote from John Newton. This is faith, a renouncing of everything we are apt to call our own, and relying wholly upon the blood, righteousness, and intercession of Jesus. John's mother had prayed that he would be a preacher and that he would tell the world of God's grace. God answered that prayer in a way that John's mother could not have even imagined. Today, John's song, Amazing Grace, is still sung all over the world. He preaches to the entire world, even centuries after his death, of God's amazing grace. I'm going to end this episode with my daughters, Emily and Jocelyn, singing for you.